Now, I want to get back to the series of essays that sit today's New York Times. This next one is by Nick Kristoff. And it's another essay on what we've lost by having this orange Nazi, this filthy subhuman in the Oval Office for the past four years. This is what Nick writes. And I want you to remember, Nick was raised on a farm in Oregon and became a writer and author and is a... uh, Columnist, opinion columnist for the New York Times. Nick writes the following, Many of my oldest friends are voting for President Trump on Tuesday. They're supporting Trump despite the arguments my pundit colleagues and I have been making, or perhaps because of them. My pro-Trump friends and readers complain that the mainstream media are biased against Trump, and thus they tune us out for being unfair and for piling on. My high school buddy, Dave Richardson, who voted for Trump warily in 2016, but is supporting him enthusiastically this year, said, quote, the picture painted by the media is a caricature of the person, end quote. The conundrum for those of us trying to change minds is that the more urgently we shout, the less we're heard. One reader, Frank J., complained, quote, we're not stupid, gullible sheep. Be fair and balanced in your reporting, and it will have more power. End quote. My childhood friend Mary Mayor likewise supported Trump and is turned off by coverage that she regards as hostile. She told me, quote, I've never known a president who has gone through so much scrutiny overlooking all the positives he has done. End quote. I understand why people like Mary voted for Trump. The loss of well-paying jobs, devastated places like my hometown, Yam Hill, Oregon. Mary spent seven years homeless, lost four relatives to suicide, and herself once put a gun to her own head before she pulled herself together with the help of a local church. Trump talked about bringing jobs back and helping ordinary workers, so she voted for the first time in her life for Trump. My old friend Janie Sitton said, explaining her vote for Trump in 2016, quote, we hoped Trump would help boost the economy and jobs, end quote. The the, uh, challenge for opponents of Trump like myself is that our denunciations of the president sometimes backfire and help him, just as polls suggest that impeachment increased support for him. Gallup shows him with his highest presidential approval numbers after being impeached. As Janie said, quote, the condescension from very loud and aggressive Trump critics has contributed big time toward conservatives feeling sympathy for him. End quote. So, in my last column before Election Day, let me explain as respectfully as I can why I'm so worked up about this election. It's partly because I believe that Trump is a charlatan who preys on my friends who trust him. Trump's own sister has said he's a liar with no principles, and his former chief of staff, General John Kelly, referred to him as, quote, the most flawed person, end quote, he has ever known. So if I'm passionate, it's because I feel he has exploited my friends and then betrayed them with his policies. How can a president be called pro-life? when he has presided over the deaths of more than 225,000 Americans from COVID-19 and still doesn't have a strategy to fight it. Trump is also working to take away health insurance from my friends. Already, the number of Americans with health insurance has dropped by 5.2 million since Trump took office. And he is trying to completely overturn the Affordable Care Act right after the election. 
I'm a great believer in community and the idea that what makes countries strong is so-called social capital, that web of relationships, beliefs, trust, decency, and identity that make a society work. Trump has taken this social fabric and acted as the great unraveler. He replaces accepted facts with lies, baseless accusations. He support uh, support for QAnon and even a conspiracy theory that President Barack Obama had SEAL Team 6 killed instead of Osama bin Laden. In both supporters and opponents, Trump nurtures hate. He is what Proverbs 6, verse 19, calls, quote, a person who stirs up conflict in the community, end quote. Trump has been a corrosive acid on America's social capital. He has cost us trust. He has dissolved our connectivity. Connectivity. I understand now why kindergarten teachers sometimes want to remove a loudmouth bully who disrupts the class and leaves it dysfunctional. That is what Trump has done to our democracy. For much of my career, I've written about national security from Afghanistan to North Korea, China to Iran. But great nations more often rot from within than suffer defeat from outside. And Trump is exacerbating longstanding divisions and weaknesses in this country. So to those who think I suffer from Trump derangement syndrome, let me explain with respect, but also urgency, that my intensity arises because I see Trump as not just a phony, but also a threat. He has left the United States a more turbulent and divided nation, one close to war with itself. Today, the greatest threat I perceive to America's national security isn't from Al-Qaeda terrorists, Russian cyber attacks, or Chinese missiles, as I see it, the greatest threat to America's national security is Trump's re-election. This is when conversation with friends becomes awkward. I may think that Trump bamboozled my pals, and they may think I'm manipulated by leftist propaganda, but we all have agency, and each think the other is using that agency to endanger a country we all love. I doubt I'll change many minds, but the only thing I can do is reach out in a good faith effort to undecided voters. Sometimes it works. Janie, a committed Christian, has worried about Democrats and abortion. But this time she will vote for Biden because she's appalled at Trump's policies toward migrants, Black Lives Matter, and health care. And also because, as she puts it, quote, God cares about oppression, justice, and the voiceless, end quote. As Janie goes, so I hope will the nation. Nick Kristoff, also writing about what we have lost with Trump. I've said before that my sense of this country has fluctuated over time. And the odd part in in reflection, what I discovered, that my my fluctuating emotions about this country had little to do with the country itself or its founding documents, but rather with the people who had assumed power and who were corrupting the country. Whether it was Lyndon Johnson or Richard Nixon or Ronald Reagan or George Herbert Walker Bush or, yes, Bill Clinton or George W. Bush Or Donald Trump. I do not believe that Barack Obama corrupted this country. 
I don't. There were several things that he did. Yes. Yes. Ordering drone strikes was one that just about drove me crazy because of the innocent people who were blown into chunks of meat and bone in order to kill a so-called terrorist. But on balance, Barack Obama against any or all of these former presidents, Barack Obama comes out, in my opinion, as a leader who came into office with a moral sense and a sense of justice and left office with a moral sense and a sense of justice. You can argue with that if you like. I've had several people in my expanded circle of friends who have taken me to task about my support for Obama. And that's fair. But this monster who sits there now, this person who has no concept of anything other than self, is doing damage to this country and has done damage to this country that it, it, it's just, it's horrifying to me. And as I said, while I've had ambiguous thoughts about this country over the course of my adult life, there have been several instances in the past four years where when I've heard about what this filthy son of a bitch has done I sit and cry. I can't hold back the tears. And they're tears of rage. And pain. Knowing what is being done in the name of the United States because of this psychotic bastard who has the reins of power. And if it's done in the name of the United States, it's being done in my name and your name. There's no way to get away from this. You have a passport. It says it right there. You are the United States. You don't have a passport. You just have your citizenship. Well, that stamps you as being part of this horror that Trump has foisted on the rest of the world and on us. And it's, it's that part, the damage he's done to us. Why is that not perceived and, and, and fought against by a hundred percent of Americans rather than 55 or 60 percent? How does this sick, evil, evil person manage to maintain that 40% of sewer dwellers who continue to see him as worthy of their adulation and praise and worship. I don't know. Hi, Truth Seekers. Mike Malloy here. As you know, we've switched formats and are now broadcast exclusively on the Progressive Voices Network. So that means you get fewer program interruptions, no corporate commercials, and lots of profanity. But our format change also means some of our radio listeners no longer hear the program. It's been a while since I mentioned our podcasts, so you may have forgotten that there is a way to listen to this program anytime you need a good dose of screaming. Visit MikeMalloy.com and subscribe to our podcast. As a podcast subscriber, you can download the program to your mobile device and take me with you wherever you go. And if you have a friend who needs a dose of truth-seeking, you can give a gift subscription as well. That's MikeMalloy.com and never miss a minute of the uncensored fun and frivolity.